Let's talk now to security analyst and uh, expert, uh, David Otto, who joins us virtually. Good morning, David. Thank you for your time. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Always our pleasure. Let, let, let's look at the situation on, on the ground uh, at first. Uh, when Russia uh, withdrew, as it said, from Kiev and Kharkiv and several other cities and uh, said it was going to concentrate its efforts on, on the Donbass, uh, many people said it was trying to put a spin uh, on what was, in fact, uh, a, a loss. Is that true, given what is going on on the ground now, the reports that are coming out of Donbass, particularly Severodonetsk uh, uh, and Luhansk? I think it depends on the, uh, the strategic objective um, that uh, Crimea uh, wanted to, to achieve. Uh, of course, um, it was very challenging uh, for, 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 of course, for, uh, uh, sorry, for Moscow to uh, make a decision as to, um, you know, how long uh, it will stay uh, overstretched. And perhaps that is one of the reasons why it decided to pull uh, its, um, its troops, you know, out of uh, uh, Kiev and towards uh, focusing on the eastern part of uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. And the, uh, um, now what we're seeing is a full concentration on the Donbass region, uh, which is, of course, in the east. So I think um, it's a matter of, uh, you know, strategic focus. You know, um, Russia wants to make sure that it consolidates uh, its position um, in that region. Of course, it had done so with Crimea. Uh, now, the two regions were declared um, as a separatist independent region of Luhansk and Donetsk, as you rightly mentioned. Uh, they want to make sure that that is secured. You know, you've got to remember that um, it's now an insurgency um, that uh, Ukraine is focusing on. They also have a really huge support uh, from uh, the European Union, from the West, uh, from the United States, uh, made up of uh, weapons, you know, volunteers, uh, a lot of, you know, monetary resources, uh, um, strategic support uh, added, made worse by the sanctions that have been added. Um, so um, I think Russia needs to, uh, in order for it to continue to uh, survive, you know, per se, it then has to focus its, uh, its effort, you know, in the eastern part where it does have, you know, some level or leverage, you know, to succeed. But this is by no means um, going to be a short war because as you've seen, uh, there is this continuous uh, push for Ukraine uh, to continue fighting. And during the insurgency phase of any battle or any war, uh, this is where most troops have been lost. You know, uh, logistics becomes a challenge. Morale of troops, you know, begins to dwindle. And of course, you know, there could be a position where the home, uh, you know, people in Moscow or entire Russia could be calling for Russia to stop the long war. So this is what the, the West wants. It wants a long war. Russia wants a short war. But at the end of the day, I think the people that are bearing the most, um, you know, uh, uh, of this war, as we've said before and before again, is um, Ukrainians. You know, they are the ones who are taking the biggest hit. Um, but of course, um, you know, let's see how it goes. You know, there is this, uh, um, you know, interparliamentary meeting that is taking place in Ukraine today. Um, it's much of a concern. They will also be discussing uh, more arms, you know, and support uh, to Ukraine. So this will be a long one, you know, for both Ukraine and, and Russia, by all means. On the ground, um, even those who, who have uh, publicly declared their opposition to uh, the Russian uh, special military operation, as they call it, or the Russian invasion of Ukraine, admit that even with all the help, my last guest on the show this morning also admitted that, that even with all the help that uh, Ukraine is getting uh, from the West, both in terms of money and equipment, uh, the mere fact that uh, against Russia, the Russians are simply too many, they have too many weapons. And so even though they are said to be suffering significant losses of both, they still have enough uh, to achieve the strategic objective in Donbass. And as you've just pointed out, uh, destroy uh, a great deal of territory and infrastructure uh, in Ukraine um, in spite of the help that Ukraine is getting. Uh, that's very correct. Um, 
uh, and he said, in spite of the help, even if the West, you know, were to directly, of course, we know that, you know, uh, you know, the U.S., the European Union, as I mentioned earlier, the West is supporting um, Ukrainian forces indirectly, but but also we know that you know there are uh, so-called volunteers or mercenaries, you know, to put it very clearly, that are being deployed to help Ukraine uh, to fight against the Russians. But the Russians have an overwhelming force um, in terms of manpower and in terms of equipment. And that is why for them to concentrate in the eastern part, in the Donbass region, makes more strategic and operational sense for them. But you've got to remember that, you know, there are different phases of a war. Uh, so, you know, even though Russia will be successful in the invasion and somehow, you know, the overwhelming force against the Ukrainians, but when it comes to the phase of you know consolidation, uh, trying to govern and hold territory, as you know I may call it, um, this is where the problem is. Because of course you know you will not have Ukrainian troops or uh, those who are supporting Ukraine fighting you know a conventional or fighting using conventional tactics. You know what they would do is the usual guerrilla. Um, you know, hit and run, and then that makes it very difficult, you know, for uh, Russia to consolidate its presence in, in the region. So as long as Ukraine uh, continues to fight, even if it's using insurgency or guerrilla tactics, um, then of course, you know, um, it will be the same scenario that, you know, Russia experienced in, in Afghanistan in the 80s. Um, so I don't see um, Russia winning the entire war um, in, in terms of, you know, um, occupying the territory without some kind of an agreement or negotiation being made. Um, if Ukraine were to continue fighting, as the narrative is, uh, you know, um, a lot of countries, you know, saying to Ukraine, you know, you're doing well, um, whereas we know that, you know, um, you know, this is not the case. Russia is overwhelmingly, um, you know, uh, winning the military battle. But as again, the key here is how long, you know, do you want to fight? You know, this is going to be a long war. Um, there are so many uh, support mechanisms that have been devised, you know, by the Western and the European Union. One of them has been a, a, a distraction tactics, which, which is then bringing in countries like Finland and, and Sweden to join NATO while the, uh, Russia is fighting in Ukraine. That simply distracts Russia, you know, from a diplomatic and psychological perspective that, OK, if we're fighting against Ukraine, then we should also perhaps um, be thinking about what happens in Finland uh, and, uh, and also in, in, in Sweden. So th there are so many different tactics that have been used. The sanctions are still there, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, you know, uh, there are so many volunteers pouring in to, into Ukraine, you know, to then join this battle. So it's going to be a very long one. And we've seen the global impact, which you mentioned, um, you know, that, you know, the price of gas, the price of oil, the price of wheat, um, the ripple effect is, it's, it's the more concerning for, for the global, um, you know, uh, world, you know, but this is long. And I don't think, you know, uh, we're getting anywhere close to uh, the end of this, you know, so-called war or, you know, um, military operation, as Russia, you know, would like to call it. I, I, before I let you go, I must ask, of course, about uh, each time you and I speak, I, I, I try to say, do you think that, you know, the conditions are now right uh, or ripe uh, for them to return possibly to Istanbul and resume those peace talks uh, that were so dramatically ended uh, so many weeks now ago? Uh, at that time, so many people thought, well, okay, uh, both sides wanted to see how much they could achieve on the ground first before they, th uh, they think of uh, peace. It's obvious now, from what you've said, that um, both sides may have achieved a bit, but may not also have achieved as much as they thought they would. And therefore, do does it appear as if peace is still looking, uh, peace talks, that is, or negotiations are, are looking more attractive and that perhaps the concessions they were not uh, uh, prepared to make in week two, they may now be able to make or willing to make in week 13. I think the biggest problem we have now, to be honest with you, is that um, Ukraine is perhaps, you know, under indirect pressure or direct pressure um, not to 
go for negotiations. Uh, and this is evidenced by the kind of support um, that they are getting, you know, from the European Union, from the Western country and from NATO itself. Um, you know, the, the, it's, it's giving the impression uh, that Ukraine can sustain the war. Um, but, you know, I think what it's not been clear to Ukraine is the, the damage that this will cause, you know, in the long term. And this, of, of course, the damage that it has already caused, the loss of lives and destruction of property, um, you know, the damaging of its economy. Um, so I think the, the, the issue here is that, you know, if you want to have a sustainable negotiation, then you've got to be able to, you know, convince both sides to, to understand that, you know, they will not achieve uh, their aims. I, I, mean, I mean, overwhelmingly, this war, it's still being fought within Ukraine. Uh, we haven't seen as much, um, you know, counterattacks in, in Russia. So Russia is still, by, by, by all means, in the advantage position, uh, you know, uh, plus its military might. Ukraine is, is fighting a war in its own country and it is suffering the most. So I think, you know, this narrative that, you know, Ukraine can win the war in the long term, it's just a geopolitical um, proxy uh, narrative, which, you know, of course, you know, the, the issue here is that, you know, the West wants to see uh, the Russian power, um, you know, dwindle. You know, they want to make sure that that global competition between Russia, China, the United States and other countries, um, Russia gets the biggest, um, downfall. But, you know, whether Russia will want to have any negotiations now is, um, is something that I don't know, because, of course, you know, with Sweden and Finland being admitted or in the process of being admitted into NATO, um, that will piece Russia off more. Russia will feel that, you know, lessons have not been learned by either side. So I think for the good of Ukraine and for the good of Ukrainians, um, this, you know, there should be talks, whether that takes place again in Istanbul or whether, um, you know, um, Tisad Erdogan supports, you know, another set of, uh, uh, you know, discussions between Russia and, uh, and Ukraine it will be a laudable idea. But from what I can see on ground, uh, I don't see both sides, you know, going to the negotiation table anytime soon, especially with, you know, Finland and Sweden you know, we're gearing up to, to join NATO. This is more distraction and not good for, for Ukraine at all. Indeed, uh, perspective, time, and uh, we'll wait and see. We'll be looking at it very closely and we'll be back with you, David Otto, very soon. Thank you in the meantime for your appearance this morning and for your analysis and perspective. Thank you.